My name is Mitka Lenassi, and I would like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Extracellular Vesicle Club. EV Club was established by Ken, but is now an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, that is ICEF. Lately, Clotilde and myself are also helping with hosting the event. And now it is my great, great pleasure and honor to welcome today's speaker, Clotilde Terry from Institute Curie, the president of ICEF and one of the leaders in the EV field, I believe we all look up to, especially in regard to rigorous and experimentally sound EV research. And I'm excited to hear about her work on breast cancer EVs and the role in inflammation, which was just today published in FNAS. I encourage everyone to place any comments or questions in the chat box during the talk, and it will be possible to unmute yourselves at the end and also ask some questions in person. And now it's over to you, Clotilde. Please share your screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Metka. And uh, yes, I'm going to share my screen now. <laughs> So I hope you're all seeing my slides um, and I'm, I'm uh, very glad to be able to present today this uh, work that has indeed been published uh, this very morning uh, in PNAS. And this work was uh, really led by Mercedes Katch, this, this very talented postdoc who was in my group for um, seven years and she's now left. So that's why it's me who's presenting rather than her. But uh, she was really uh, the, the, the very uh, strong leader of this, uh, this work. So um, I'm just going to put my laser. Yes. So the, the starting point of this work was that uh, in my team, we've uh, always been interested in, in understanding what uh, extracellular vesicles do. And uh, as you all know, there are lots of different types of extracellular vesicles that are released by uh, most cells in their environment. The smallest uh, vesicles can, can either form at the plasma membrane from protrusions of the plasma membrane or inside uh, multivesicular compartments and be released when these multivesicular bodies fuse with the plasma membrane. So these all are, are small EVs. There are also larger extracellular vesicles that form uh, at the plasma membrane also, but either from protrusions or from larger parts of the membrane. But something, and, and all these EVs can interact with uh, their environment, with surrounding cells or with the extracellular mat matrix, or they can uh, go at distance and, and uh, affect tissues at a longer distance. But um, what we often forgot, uh, forget when we analyze uh, EVs, and in our case, we analyze EVs uh, in the context of two more immune system interaction, what we often forget is that the, the two more cells or cells in general do not secrete only EVs, but they also secrete smaller structures like the exomeres that have been described by the, by the Zhang group uh, uh, re, uh, three years ago, or supermeres that have been described by the coffee group uh, even more recently, and they also secrete soluble factors. So one question we, we started uh, asking ourselves uh, in the last few years was, uh, what was the respective contribution of EVs and these other smaller or soluble secreted factors in the tumor interaction with the immune system? And to uh, first identify the best, um, the best uh, function to analyze, we first started um, analyzing uh, how in uh, EVs interact with uh, immune cells in general and what's the most efficient immune cells that uh, can um, capture or can uh, interact with EVs. So for this, we used a uh, um, breast carcinoma cell line, the MDMB231 cells that I'm going to use for, uh, that I'm, I'm gonna, we are going to use for the rest of this uh, uh, project. Uh, we have made uh, these cells to express uh, CD9, uh, tetraspenin CD9 fused to do TD tomato, and we isolated EVs from these cells and exposed them to uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, mixed uh, immune cells, in order to find which ones were uh, capturing or, or interacting with these uh, EVs most efficiently. And what was very striking when we uh, identified the TD tomato fluorescent uh, immune cells was that the vast majority of the ones that had captured uh, EVs were monocytes. Uh, their monocytes represented 80% of the 
cells that had captured EVs, whereas there are only 10 or 15 percent uh, um, of, of the population of PBMCs. So among uh, human blood immune cells, monocytes are really the major population capturing tumor derived EVs. So when you know that um, in, in tumors, there are lots of macrophages, that macrophages uh, are, are thought to differentiate from monocytes that have uh, um, been uh, entering the tumor from the bloodstream, and that all these macrophages uh, inside the tumors are, are, are known, are thought to uh, affect um, in various manners the, the tumor growth. Uh, the question was now, how would EVs, uh, would EVs be able to affect the differentiation of these macrophages, the tumor-derived EVs, and would they um, be instrumental in uh, establishment of, of macrophages in the tumor? So um, to uh, then determine how EVs were doing this job uh, as compared to the other soluble factors secreted by, by tumors, because there are lots of them, uh, what we started using was this uh, technique, the size exclusion chromatography, which um, had been uh, first uh, used for EV isolation by the group of Frank Noland uh, already six or seven years ago. Uh, the size exclusion chromatography is a very good tool because if you use, um, if you uh, start from concentrated condition medium, here we started from condition medium from this MDA MB231 cell line, tumor cell line, um, you put it on, on top of the colon and then the EVs, they go very fast through the colon because they don't enter the pores of the colon, whereas the small components, they are retained behind. And it makes this um, uh, very uh, efficient way of separating the EVs that, that first exit the colon in the first few fractions, whereas the soluble uh, factors like proteins exit the colons later. And we had used this um, in a work performed with the group of Ken Whitwell actually uh, three years ago to show that one component that often used as a marker of exosome, acetylcholinesterase, is in fact not associated with EVs, but mainly a soluble factor. So here we use that on the concentrated condition medium of MDMB231, and we analyze all the fractions uh, um, obtained from these colons, and this is shown here um, on a Western blot, you see on the top panel the total proteins, and you see very clearly that the proteins start uh, exiting the colon after the 12th fraction, more or less, and then they are very abundant in the later fractions. The EV markers like CD63 and CD9, they are clearly um, detected, recovered in the first fractions from 7 to about 12, 13, 14 uh, maximum. Um, other um, classical markers of EVs like, like HSC70 or, or syntenin are also recovered in this first fraction from 7 to 12 or 13. Whereas uh, I want to raise your attention here to this uh, protein 1433, which is often uh, claimed to be a marker of, of EVs or of exosomes. And clearly uh, by Western, but we could show uh, that this 1433 is in fact not in EVs, but rather in the soluble fractions uh, from the size exclusion chromatography colon. So uh, for the rest of this work, we decided to compare what we recovered in the EV rich fractions, which we uh, restricted to the fraction seven to 11 to be sure not to be contaminated with other proteins, and this is the aspect of the EVs, versus the EV poor fractions that we recovered in the fractions, uh, the later fraction from uh, 15 to uh, 20. And what we did then to analyze the functions, to compare the functions of these different pools of fractions, we um, pull them and uh, put them in culture together with uh, CD14 monocytes, the monocytes that are <laughs> uh, the, the most efficient to capture EVs. And we cultured these monocytes for five days and then analyzed the survival and the phenotype of uh, these cells. And as you see here, when we counted the number of live cells, uh, monocyte derived cells in this culture after five days, we could clearly see that both the EV rich and the EV poor fractions were uh, inducing a good survival uh, of these monocytes, almost as efficient as what we observed when we use recombinant growth factors that are known to be specific for monocytes or myeloid cells, like uh, the CSF1 here in pink or the GMCSF in, in purple. But an interesting observation was 
that when we analyzed the, the phenotype of these uh, monocytes that had been differentiated, the survived in vitro, by using uh, several uh, surface markers, and here I'm showing only CD163 and CD206, which are uh, macro, uh, markers of subtypes of macrophages, we could clearly see that both markers were expressed by all these uh, macrophages and monocytes that are thus macrophages, but with different patterns. As you see here, the EV-rich induced macrophages expressed lower level of CD163 than the EV poor fraction uh, induced macrophages uh, and, and, and um, uh, sorry, higher level of CD163 and lower level of CD206, for instance. Uh, but when we analyzed the, the total number of this uh, CD163 positive, CD206 positive macrophages in this culture, we could uh, see uh, as efficient uh, induction uh, of this differentiation of these uh, cells by the EV rich and the EV poor fractions. So that was the first observation that both uh, soluble factors and EVs can uh, induce the survival of uh, monocytes and their differentiation into macrophages in vivo. So to show that the, uh, the EV-rich fraction, the, the, what was uh, important for this uh, effect in the EV-rich fraction was really EVs. What we did was to um, knock out RAB11A in the MDA MB231 in order to decrease the release of EVs by these cells. And this on the left, you see only the efficiency of the knockout of RAB11A in the cells. And on the, la on the right, the EV count from the control versus knockout uh, RAB11A uh, cells. So RAB11A knockout decreases the overall level of EV release by this MDMB231. And when we use the, um, the EV rich fraction from these two cell lines on the uh, monocytes, we could clearly uh, observe that the EV rich fractions from the RAB11 knockout. Uh, um, uh, cells were much less efficient at inducing uh, differentiation, survival and differentiation of the monocytes, whereas the EV poor fractions were as efficient, uh, whether they came from the rabid level knockout or the control um, cells. So the EVs in the EV rich fractions are uh, important, are necessary to induce the differentiation and survival of monocytes uh, in this in vitro culture system. So how could this happen? What on EVs could do uh, this, this job? So as we know that there are uh, lots of growth factors or, or survival factors, chemokines, cytokines that are um, uh, important for EV, for monocyte survival, we analyze their presence in the EV rich and EV poor fractions of the condition medium. And uh, as you see here on this uh, scheme, what um, we could clearly see was that um, a majority of the cytokines, there are much more than what I'm showing here, a majority of the cytokines uh, released by this MDMB231 are released and recovered in the EV poor fraction on the right here. But one of these cytokines, CSF1, was in fact clearly detected in the EV rich fractions. So that was uh, suggesting that maybe CSF1 on the EVs was responsible for the effect on monocyte survival and uh, differentiation that we observed in vitro. So to prove this hypothesis, what we did was um, first to uh, demonstrate that we indeed had CSF1 on the EVs, and to do so, what we used was first uh, image stream based uh, analysis of single EVs. So, uh, image stream uh, allows to analyze uh, very small particles like extracellular vesicles, which are defined as particles that are um, too small to be detected in the SSC uh, side scatter channel. So they are present in this lower uh, gate down here, but they are uh, brightly labeled by a lipid dye uh, called membrite. So this is the gate of EVs. And as you see here, the EVs are not detected in the um, side scatter channel, but they are clearly uh, green in membrite. Then we label them with CD81 uh, as a surface marker of EVs. And here is the gate of the CD81 positive EVs in this preparation. Here is the uh, image. And when we um, use the third antibody and against CSF1, uh, we could clearly see some events uh, that were positive for CSF1 
in this uh, gate of CD81 positive EVs. And this is represented here at the bottom. It's about 50% of the CD81 positive EVs that are positive for CSF1. And we also used another system that we uh, now use uh, quite a lot in the lab, which is the Maxplex EXO uh, kit from Milteni, which is a system where you have uh, 37 different beads that are each coated with a different antibody that will capture EVs. And then you can label the EVs that are captured by the beads with either a cocktail of anti tetraspanin antibodies, which is provided by, the, by, by Milteni, and that allows to see uh, CD9, CD63, and CD81 positive EVs. Or here, what we did was to use an anti-CSF1 antibody to label the EVs. And we could clearly see um, a positive signal uh, on the EVs captured by either CD9 or CD29, which was the strongest signal, uh, showing that these EVs bearing CD9 or CD29 also bear CSF1. The EVs bearing CD81 or CD44 also bear this signal, and other EVs bear much less uh, of this CSF1. But this was to show that CSF1 was indeed present on the EVs released by these MDMB231 cells. So now, was this CSF1 on EVs responsible for the effect of uh, monocyte differentiation and survival? So the first experiment we did was to do our in vitro um, differentiation assay in the presence of antibodies, uh, blocking antibodies, blocking either the CSF1 receptor or the GM-CSF receptor. And as you see here, the anti-CD uh, CSF1 receptor was clearly blocking the ability of uh, EV rich fractions to induce uh, monocyte uh, survival and differentiation in this culture. Uh, whereas the anti-GM-CSF receptor was not uh, inhibiting at all this uh, monocyte differentiation and survival. So that was the first hint that CSF1 on EVs was important for their effect on monocyte and macrophages. And then what we did was to knock out CSF1 in the MDMB231 cells uh, by using two, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system with two guide RNAs. And the guide RNA2 here was much more efficient than guide RNA1 to decrease uh, the, the CSF1 level uh, in the cell condition medium uh, and in the EVs. And in the EVs with the guide RNA2, we could not detect uh, the, above the, the background signal CSF1 on EVs anymore, whereas we could detect some still uh, with the guide RNA1. So these EVs released by MDMB231 uh, knocked out for CSF1 were used to uh, uh, in the in vitro monocyte differentiation assay. And as you see here, the EVs from uh, the, the guide RNA2, the most uh, efficiently uh, knocked out uh, uh, cells for CSF1, were much less efficient than the EVs from wild type uh, MDMB231 to induce survival and differentiation of monocytes. So that was a first mechanistic uh, hint as to what on EVs can uh, affect monocytes. So the CSF1 is uh, on, on EVs. But now, what, um, what would be uh, the, the, the consequences of this expression of CSF1? So a first observation we, we looked for was uh, what, which kind of tumors uh, were expressing CSF1. And this is just uh, uh, from the public database of mRNA expression in breast, uh, in many cancer cell line, but we analyzed it in breast cancer cell line. And what we could clearly see by this analysis was that mainly the basal breast cancer, uh, which are also called triple negative breast cancer, were the ones that expressed a lot of CSF1, much more uh, abundantly than uh, other types of uh, breast cancer like luminal A or luminal B. So we took three of these cell lines to uh, another uh, triple negative breast cancer, BT549, in addition to MDMB231, and the MCF, MCF7 cell line, which is a luminal A cell line and was not uh, apparently expressing a lot of CSF1 mRNA, uh, to, to uh, double check uh, our CSF1 results on these cells. So what we could clearly see was that indeed when we detected CSF1 in the condition medium of these three different cell lines, there was much less in the condition medium of MCF7 as compared to the two triple negative cell line. And we could only detect CSF1 on EVs from the two triple negative breast cancer cell line, MDMB231 and BT549, and not on the EVs from the MCF7. 
Then when we use these EVs to differentiate monocytes, we had more or less the same results as with the knockout of CSF1, meaning that the EVs from MCF7 were much less efficient than the EVs from the two triple negative breast cancer cell line expressing CSF1 to induce the monocyte survival and differentiation. And then we were able to reconstitute um, uh, MCF7 by overexpressing CSF1 in it. So in that case, we had much more CSF1 secreted by MCF7 in the condition medium and now some detectable on the EVs. And in these conditions, we had much more uh, uh, monocytes uh, differentiated into macrophages, surviving and differentiated into macrophages when exposed to the MCF7 EVs expressing CSF1. So again, that was the, uh, the clear proof that CSF1 on EVs is required for this uh, monocyte survival uh, and differentiation in vitro. So what were uh, the consequences of this um, monocyte differentiation? So to, to address more precisely this uh, question, what we did was to um, then perform an exhaustive RNA sequencing of the macrophages that had been um, obtained after this five days culture in, in either in the presence of EV rich fractions or EV poor fractions or in the presence of uh, CSF1, recombinant CSF1, or of the concentrated condition medium. And by um, performing analyzing this RNA-seq data by k-means K -means clustering, we could uh, really uh, observe that there were different signature of genes induced uh, um, in the macrophages exposed uh, to these different uh, treatments. And in particular, we could uh, clearly detect a signature in this cluster five here, a signature of genes that were uh, specifically induced in the macrophages uh, exposed monocytes exposed to the EV rich fractions. Uh, whereas um, this cluster four here uh, was a signature of genes uh, in, uh, by contrast, induced by the EV poor fraction of, uh, of the MDMB231 condition medium. So these different treatments induce really macrophages with different uh, gene, gene expression and thus potentially different functions. And when we uh, perform the uh, gene ontology analysis of the genes expressed in these different signatures, what was clear was that the EV rich fractions um, induced in macrophages a signature of interferon signaling pathways, cytokine signaling, but mainly interferon, lymphocyte proliferation, et cetera. So an interferon response like signature was induced by this EV rich fraction, whereas this was not the case in the monocytes uh, differentiating to macrophages after exposure to the EV poor fractions, which were more um, displaying signature of neutrophils or of um, metabolic or glycolytic processes. So that was very interesting to us to see this interferon response-like signature induced in the monocytes, um, because that's a sign of a sort of inflammatory response. And the first question we asked was, uh, what could be the reason for these uh, EV-rich uh, fractions to, uh, to induce this interferon signature? So the hypothesis we had was that um, some cargos of the EVs would uh, be transferred into the monocytes to activate the very known uh, pathway of sting, which is known to uh, induce the type 1 interferon and interferon stimulated genes. And one of the, the known um, uh, molecules that activate sting is this uh, denucleotide uh, nucleotide called CGAMP, which is uh, induced uh, in the, the cytosol of cells, which express CGAS, when CGAS recognizes DNA in the cytosol. So the cytosolic DNA can be a sign of infection, for instance, but it can also be present in some tumor cells, and it's, it's not normal. But when CGAS recognizes cytosolic DNA, it creates this um, cyclic G GAMP, CGAM, cyclic G uh, AMP, GMP, 
And well, we uh, postulated that this CGAM could end up in EVs and that these EVs, after they had uh, contacted the monocyte through the CSF1, CSF1 uh, receptor interaction, would then be able maybe to transfer the CGAM into the, the cells to induce these uh, interferon-stimulated gen genes. So to uh, address this hypothesis, we um, tried both ways to inhibit the sting pathway in the monocytes or to inhibit CGAMP uh, and the CGAS pathway in the MDA tumor cells. So to uh, analyze the, the, the data, we choose three uh, interferon stimulated uh, genes uh, to analyze the, the proteins uh, coming from three of these interferon stimulated genes. Uh, one, IRF7, is um, mainly uh, uh, only expressed by, uh, by monocytes exposed to the EV-rich fractions and not at all by the EV-poor fractions, nor by the soluble CSF1. Uh, others, like the uh, chemokine CXCL9 or CXCL10, are also induced by the other treatments, but more strongly induced by uh, the EV-rich fractions in the blue bar here. So we analyzed the uh, response of these three, uh, the expression of these three proteins uh, in monocytes where we had inhibited um, the sting pathway using this uh, sting inhibitor called H151. And what we could observe was that um, clearly the IRF7 uh, expression was strongly uh, uh, decreased or even abolished by this sting inhibitor in the monocytes, whereas the CXCL10 expression was not affected and the CXCL9 expression was decreased significantly, although not to a 100% level. So that suggested that these three uh, interferon stimulated genes um, responded differently, but uh, uh, IRF7, some of them were, were uh, clearly dependent on the sting pathway for their expression induced by the EV rich fractions. And then the other uh, arm of the pathway, the SIGA sting, um, the SIGA SIGAM pathway, we addressed it by uh, inhibiting SIGAS uh, expression in the MDMB231 cells and by uh, detecting SIGAMP. Uh, by quantifying CGAM by ELISA in the EV rich or EV poor fractions. And as you can see here, we could clearly detect CGAM both in the EV rich and in the EV poor fractions of the condition medium of MDMB231. And this uh, level uh, of detection was clearly decreased when we knocked out CGAS in the MDMB231 here in the dark blue bars. So this showed that was the first uh, demonstration that CGAM was indeed uh, could indeed be present in EVs. And then when we used these EVs, uh, EV retractions from the, the CGAS knockout, uh, uh, MDMB231 cells, and analyzed uh, the, these uh, interferon stimulated genes, we could see a, a decrease, a significant decrease of the induction uh, this time of CXCL10 and also of IRF7, although the decrease of IRF7 was not as strong with the sting uh, inhibition. So these results were uh, showing that, uh, as we suspected, there is the pathway of sting and CGAS, which is uh, uh, activated when EVs uh, containing a CGAMP uh, released by tumors contact monocytes. But obviously, this is not the only explanation. There are, there are uh, other um, probably sting independent and CGAS independent pathways that the EVs can induce in monocytes. So now the next question was, um, what about this signature of macrophages that we observe that's induced by EVs? Could, could it have a consequences on the type of functions that these macrophages play uh, in, in vivo? So the first uh, hint uh, that these macrophages could be differently functioning differently than uh, than other than the macrophages, for instance, induced by the EV poor uh, fractions or by uh, recombinant CSF1, was that when we compare their gene signature um, with the, the classical signatures of uh, macrophages called M1 versus M2. Um, by uh, in vitro studies, the M1 being thought to be more pro-inflammatory and uh, the M2 more uh, um, pro-healing. Um, 
so what we clearly observed was the, the EV rich induced signature of gene was uh, more enriched in genes expressing the M1 signature than any of the other uh, signature of other macrophages. So that suggested that uh, our EV retractions induced macrophages with a prominent signature of M1, a meaning pro-inflammatory, which should be uh, anti-tumoral, and which was not, not really consistent with what people have in mind in general, that EVs from tumors uh, induce uh, pro-tumoral macrophages. So to try to address this question, what we then asked was whether any of these results we had obtained from uh, in vitro studies um, could be uh, correlated with observation in real tumors in vivo. So the first thing we did was to take um, uh, samples that we had obtained uh, through this collaboration with uh, Vasily Soumelis here in Curie and Philemon Sylvain, um, samples that were um, small pieces of tumor tissue or adjacent tissues uh, from uh, breast cancer patients treated at the Institut Curie. Uh, these small pieces of tissues had been put uh, in culture overnight and then the condition medium had been collected. And we got this condition medium and um, analyzed, analyzed it either uh, in a, a crude or uh, here, or after EV isolation, in this case, we did a, a crude ultra centrifugation just to pellet all the EVs. And uh, we measured CSF1 in these um, uh, samples. And we could clearly see that um, the juxta tumor tissues did not express a lot of CSF1 at all. We could clearly detect CSF1 in the uh, condition medium of the tumor tissues, both in the triple negative breast cancer and in the luminal uh, breast cancer patients with no significant difference. But when we analyzed the EVs from this condition medium, it was now clear that uh, the CSF1 was detected on the EVs from the triple negative breast cancer patients, but hardly or not in, uh, on the EVs of the luminal uh, breast cancer patients. So that confirmed our first observation that uh, uh, with the breast cancer cell line that CSF1 uh, on EVs is mainly a feature of triple negative breast cancer patients. So now, uh, what, what about the, the macrophages uh, that were induced uh, in vitro, that we had observed induced in vitro by these EVs bearing CSF1? Could we find them in real tumor in vivo? So um, uh, to, to answer this question, we took the signature of the, <clears throat> the genes that were the most upregulated in the EV-rich uh, induced macrophages, which is illustrated here, and we analyzed the presence of this signature of the EV uh, rich induced macrophages in um, a data set generated here at Curie by our collaborator, Emmanuel Romano and Eleonora Timperi and Paul Gegen. Uh, um, they, they had performed a single cell RNA seq on the um, myeloid cells expressing CD11 C and HLADR of these triple negative breast cancer patients. And they had um, analyzed this single cell RNA sec, and we search for this signature in these uh, uh, clusters of uh, macrophages that they have observed. So on the left, you see all the clusters of macrophages analyzed by the, the single cell RNA sec experiment. And then in the middle, you see the overlay with the gene signature of the EV rich induced macrophages. And as you see, it's clearly corresponding to a very defined. A subpopulation of these macrophages in the cluster of triple negative uh, breast cancer patients. Um, <clears throat> it's mainly these macrophages plus a little bit of these ones, which is the cluster six. Whereas the EV poor induced signature corresponds to a mixture of different uh, macrophages that are more distributed among the different populations observed in this uh, single cell RNA seq. But what we concluded from that was that <clears throat> the macrophages that are induced to, differenti to differentiate when they are exposed to tumor derived EVs um, really exist in vivo in real tumors, uh, which was really a, a striking result. And now, uh, what about these macrophages? Can we correlate this pre the presence of these macrophages um, in the different types of tumors? 
uh, with some uh, outcomes of, of, uh, of uh, survival or, or behavior of the patients. So we used uh, for this the uh, public data set of the metabric cohort of breast cancer patients. And we uh, first uh, analyzed the presence, the uh, uh, intensity of expression of the EV rich or EV poor induced signature in macrophages. And as you see here, we could confirm that the triple negative breast cancer um, where the, the main were more uh, abundantly expressing this EV rich induced macrophage signature more than uh, the other types of, of uh, breast cancer, whereas the EV poor induced signature was equivalently uh, expressed in all types of uh, breast cancers. And then <clears throat> what the final thing we did was to uh, uh, plot the survival curve of the <clears throat> patients expressing either the EV rich or the EV poor fraction uh, of the uh, signature. And uh, what we could clearly observe was that the patients expressing a higher level of the EV rich induced macrophage signature were surviving better than the patients expressing a low level of this signature. Whereas this, um, <clears throat> the level of EV poor uh, signature expression was not uh, correlated, <coughs> sorry, with any survival effect. So <clears throat> that was really uh, very interesting to see this better survival of patients uh, when they were expressing a high expression, uh, high level of the EV rich induced <clears throat> gene signature. And the final uh, information was that. An interesting observation was that the EV rich induced signature was also correlated with, oops, sorry, <clears throat> with a higher level of um, signature of uh, immune, T, immune cells that can kill tumor like the CDA T cells, the NK cells, but also the T Rex. So that's uh, <clears throat> the conclusion of this paper. <clears throat> Sorry again. So this is the summary of, of what uh, we show in this paper. So that first of all, the triple negative breast cancer cells release EVs that bear the cytokine CSF1 and the other cytokines are not EV associated. That these EVs bearing CSF1 promote differentiation of the macrophage subtype with a particular pro-inflammatory interferon stimulated <clears throat> like gene signature. And this induction of this gene signature is dependent both on CGAS and sting dependent and independent pathways. That these macrophages are present in tumors of triple negative breast cancer patients, <clears throat> which correlates with a better survival and a potentially anti-tumoral immune infiltrate. So that suggests that some types of tumor EVs may be beneficial for the patient instead of detrimental. And what we are now exploring is the, the use of these EVs for a therapeutic purpose in these this patients. But that's really the purpose of the uh, next uh, several years of, of work. So I'm gonna stop here and this is uh, uh, the, the team of people who have worked on it. So Mercedes Katch is here. She was, as I said, the, the uh, main driving force of this work, but almost everybody from the team uh, helped her. Uh, they are listed here, and it was also a big collaboration with many other groups uh, at Curie, but also outside. And I think I'm gonna stop here and take questions if there are any, and take a glass of water if I can. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs> so thank you, Clotilde. I think this was really an, another excellent study. And I think tomorrow we're all going to download this paper and <laughs> read more about it. So there's been already some questions there. I have also some, but I'll wait with mine. And um, let's start. I will, uh, I will just, um, just a second. I will allow the participants to unmute themselves. And I will just call the, um, the names of the ones who pose the question and you can um, just come live and ask her questions. So, um, Raja Lashmi? Hey. Uh, uh, okay, perfect. Hi. Uh, uh, it was great to uh, learn this. 
so I'm a beginner with the EV uh, study. So I have a few questions um, regarding the treatment methods and some of your uh, data. Uh, though, so my first question is, um, you showed in the beginning of your um, uh, presentation, you showed a graph of um, uh, fluorescently labeled EVs taken up by different immune cells. In that you showed the highest percentage was for monocytes. So my question is, is this uh, based on the total number of each of the immune cells or in general, uh, the, just the percentage. I, I mean, like for example, um, there will be like different immune cells, right? So the total number of each immune cells will be different. Uh, for example, there will be more monocytes and less uh, T cells. So this percentage, will it vary with respect to the total number of each of these immune cells? So it was not presented, yes, it's a very good question. It was not presented as uh, in relation with the, the total number of immune cells, but uh, we are now doing these studies very uh, routinely and we always see, so when you take PBMCs, monocytes represent more or less 15 to 20% depending on, on the donors. Um, so here we had 80% of the fluorescent cells that were monocytes. So it's really a strong, a strong um, mm -hmm. uh, bias in favor of the monocytes for uh, capturing these uh, EVs. And okay. the T cells, CD4 and CD8 T cells are much more abundant uh, mm -hmm. in the PBMCs, but they are not the most uh, uh, abundant in the fluorescent population. Okay. Thank you. And another question is, um, like you showed like different EV rich and soluble rich fractions in your in vitro studies, right? So uh, how do you normalize these when you use uh, in the in vitro system? Is it based on like a protein volume or the particle oh, yeah. numbers? That's a, that's always indeed a very uh, tricky question, and and, mm -hmm. and we we so the first um, uh, experiments when we did not know what could be present in EVs or in in the soluble fractions, we normalized by protein. Of okay. course, we could not normalize by by particle numbers because mm -hmm. there are no particles in the EV core fractions. So we normalize by the protein uh, amount and put the same amount of proteins from EVs or from the yes, EV poor fractions. Mm -hmm. And then when we started realizing that CSF1 was the, the molecule uh, on the EVs that was present both on EVs and in the soluble fractions, uh, we, we started normalizing by uh, amount of CSF1 fed to the monocytes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Because we are also planning similar experiments, so we have these questions always when we run mm -hmm. some of our in vitro uh, experiments. Uh, my last question is, um, you showed in your sequencing for the macrophage, um, BR positive and CD11C positive uh, cells, right? So um, is this CD11C a fan marker for macrophage? Um, well, initially it was more, it, it's uh, in, in mouse at least, it's a, ma a marker of dendritic cells rather than macrophages, but it's also expressed a little bit on macrophages. So in this in this data set, there were um, myel myeloid cells, both dendritic cells and macrophages. Uh, this data set is not published yet. Our collaborators, they are uh, still doing experiments to publish the, the whole data set. So in, in this paper, we only um, publish the, the parts that's on macrophages. So it's a mixture of macrophages, dendritic yeah. cells. And, and and also, uh, I'm not sure if it's human or mouse. Um, no, no, it's uh, human. The, uh, human. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, the, the CD. Uh, 11c like m2 will be negative for uh, cd 11c right like i'm i'm, I'm not sure like um, no i'm not sure that the m2 m1 is, is anyway in a very uh, strong uh, okay. uh, characterization yeah thank you thank you yeah, thank you so much for this uh, mini discussion so it was very informative and um Arindam, if you're here please um, you can thanks Claudia, for the next Mm -hmm. cell culture medium it's immediately used uh, for differentiation monocytes or it's frozen and later used to differentiate them well uh, in most cases um, what mercedes was doing was to take um, several batches of evs uh, on several monocyte donors uh, at the same time so in most cases the, the evs were frozen at minus 80 but in aliquots and never uh, sewed up and refrozen to be used afterwards. 
Um, maybe in some op occasions she could use fresh, but we never did the side-by-side the -side comparison of a fresh versus frozen. For, for practical reasons, I know, I mean, it, it theoretically it would be better to use fresh EVs, but for practical reasons, it's always a bit complicated when you do this uh, long, uh, heavy experiments. Okay, but and by any chance, you know how you froze the, I mean, in which culture media? We fr freeze in PBS in very concentrated, I mean, the EVs are very concentrated and we make aliquots and, and freeze them at minus 80 without any uh, additional um, buffer protection or whatever. We just leave them in PBS. Okay, thanks. Mm. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, Pfizer? Okay, thank you for a very nice uh, talk, Kelotil. Uh, I have a question because uh, CSF has a one transmembrane um, helix. So I suppose that if uh, they are present in a CSF is present in the large EVs that are usually uh, isolated by high speed centrifugation before size exclusion. Did you uh, perform any high speed centrifugation such as 10,000 G or 20,000 G before size exclusion or not? No, <clears throat> we always perform a 2000 G centrifugation before the size exclusion chromatography to eliminate very large uh, EVs. Uh, we, we, and, and with the size exclusion chromatography, we know that we recover all EVs together, um, the, the small or the intermediate, uh, et cetera, we, not, not only the, the very small ones. Um, we did not uh, check, we did not compare the CSF1 level on uh, differential ultracentrifugation EVs. This we didn't do, or maybe Mercedes did in the very beginning, but we did not uh, keep track of that. So indeed, yeah, CSF1 has a transmembrane domain. So that's a very, very, very good uh, remark. And we, we, are now trying to understand why CSF1 is on EVs, whether it's because of this transmembrane domain or because of other, um, other binding um, sites on the EVs. Uh, we don't have the answer yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think Jan has a great follow-up question to that. So. Yeah, it's perfect timing. Thank you very much, yeah. Clotilde. It was uh, exactly that question I was going to dig into. I, I tried to read quickly about CSF1 um, uh, during your presentation because it is, or at least the precursor has a transmembrane domain, but it is considered to be a released uh, cytokine that is freely available and mediates its biology through a receptor. Um, do you think that the, uh, the CSF1 is more potent when it's on the, on the EVs or does it need to be released from the EVs? And, and if so, what would be the mechanism of that release? It, is it a enzymatic uh, cleavage or, or what's your... Mm, we, I think that's well, really exciting, you know, that's really... <laughs> We thank you, thank you, Jan. We yeah. we never. I mean, we always. I mean, in in our mind, CSF one is not released uh, from the EVs, and it can it can still bind to its receptor while being uh, stuck to the EVs because it's not stuck to the EVs through the its receptor. Although it could be, we we, we have not. Uh, again, we don't have the exact uh, knowledge now on on why CSF one is on EVs. We think that uh, CSF1 on EVs is much more efficient than the soluble CSF1 because when we compared the amount of uh, recombinant CSF1 we needed to use to induce the survival of the monocytes in our in vitro culture, it was 5,000 more than the amount of CSF1 we detected on EVs. But it's difficult to really compare this to a quantification of recombinant CSF1 or, or EV. So we, we cannot say that very, very strongly. But yeah, my, my idea is actually that it's, it's not cleaved to function, that it, it remains uh, on the EVs to function. And in fact, we also, I, I, I think I remember Mercedes did a few experiments where she mixed EVs that did not have CSF1 with soluble CSF1 uh, in the culture, and it was not uh, doing uh, as if uh, with very low level of CSF1, and it was not inducing the survival. So I think the CSF1 on EVs acts still when it's on EVs, but it's 
not I, I have not demonstrated it. Can I just take the quick chance to promote uh, Jeff as well? And tell everybody <laughs> that have uh, uh, EV focused, EV centric <laughs> research, uh, please consider uh, to submit it to Jeff. We also do take uh, methodological papers and uh, look forward to your to your contributions, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. But there is also the new journal of uh, ISEV, the Journal of Extracellular Biology, that, that can also be <laughs> considered. Yes, for yes, yes. I work with uh, Andy very closely, and uh, we interact and, and send papers to each other as well. But I'm promoting Jeff. That's my job. <laughs> I'm promoting okay. both. It's my job. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Jan. Yeah, so I think there's yeah there's a lot of options for um, EV researchers to really go to the ISEF supported um, journals and publish there. So that's great. Um, I have maybe just a follow up question. Um, do you think that it could be the reason for better um, stimulation could be um, that this uh, CSF is more concentrated in EVs, like in kind of like the in, um, in some parts that it's not just like one molecule in space, but just together like egg not aggregate, yeah. but accumulate. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, it's it's the, the general uh, idea of, of uh, well, there were there were these papers uh, from the group of Alad Clayton a long time ago saying that TGF beta, for instance, was much more efficient when it was on EVs than than the free soluble form. And yeah, the, the, the general idea is that what you suggest that since it's like more concentrated, there is more of these molecules on the surface of EVs. It could make it uh, like cluster receptors on uh, the target cells or mm -hmm. that kind of things. But this again, I don't think it's been demonstrated. I'm not sure how we could demonstrate it. Yes, well, yes, you know, for future. <laughs> um, so Paola um, has a question. Hi, yes, I was just wondering when you discussed the uh, human um, breast tumor samples, were those taken um, pre-treatment or after the patient received any chemo or radiation? Uh, no, this, yeah, the patient-derived samples, they were uh, pre-any wow. any treatment. Okay. And were they fresh samples or were, did you receive them snap frozen and how did you sort of deal with that? So for the for for the ones that we analyzed the condition medium of, uh, they were fresh. They were gotten. I mean, we we are at Institut Curie. We have the the, the surgery room just next door, so uh, they were fresh. They were put in culture immediately, uh, and uh, and uh, and I'm sure that it's the same for the single cell RNA seq uh, analysis because you cannot do it properly on on snap frozen cells. I must say I did not ask them, but it seemed obvious to me that it was fresh samples, and we have the the, the circuitry to obtain these fresh samples from the surgery room here at Curie. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. And Sanoi has a follow up question to that. Yes, I do. Thank you for an incredible talk. Um, my question is also sort of similar to Paula's in the sense that did you control for the stage of the triple neg um, breast cancer? I'm just out of curiosity thinking in terms of the anti-tumoral effects that you saw, whether biologically is that associated with the different stages of breast cancer in terms of EVs? Well, we, we did not... I think we did not have enough uh, samples to do any any really statistical, significantly statistical analysis. So for the the breast cancer patients that we analyzed, the condition medium of the tumor explants, we had only about a, a dozen of samples in total, uh, six triple negative breast cancers, and and the same of the non triple negative breast cancer. So uh, I, I don't think we have anything that's on, on the stage of the triple negative breast cancer. And Dolores is also here. So um, Dolores, if you would just ask your question live. Hi, uh, sorry, I, I, got, uh, I got here late, so I, I didn't hear the whole presentation, but I was wondering if, uh, so you're focusing everything on macrophages, uh, and maybe this has been discussed already, but what about other myeloid cells? And the no. reason why I'm asking that is because we are seeing uh, that the cytokine response to, especially to large EVs more than small EVs, 
um, involves an upregulation of cytokines, most of which seem to um, enroll neutrophil function. No, well, I mean, in the, the, the beginning of the work was really to show that monocytes were the cells that were mainly uptaking uh, tumor-derived EVs. So that's why then we, we followed up on that and, and would looked at macrophages. Neutrophiles don't, don't form from monocytes, right? So uh, we did not analyze neutrophiles. Um, we know, I mean, in, in the previous work we had done uh, about 10 years ago uh, using mouse models of breast cancer, we know that some mouse models are indeed very, very, um, uh, very, very uh, infiltrated with neutrophiles, like the 41 uh, mouse tumor cell line. When it grows in vivo, it's full of neutrophils and, and very little monocyte or macrophages. So there are very different, many different types of uh, immune infiltrates depending on, on the tumors. We did not follow on the neutrophils. We, yeah, no, we did not analyze the neutrophils. It, it could be a tumor specific uh, effect. That's what you're seeing. Because also, the yes, but I think it would be actually the neutrophil signature uh, was actually detected in the EV poor induced macrophage, uh, in EV poor induced cells. So, I if anything, the neutrophil, the neutrophils, they were more present in the monocytes exposed, differentiated upon uh, exposure to the soluble cytokine. And indeed, the, the uh, MDMB231 uh, secretes a tons of GMCSF, which is the granulocyte macrophage for multifactor, the neutrophile stimula uh, stimulating factor. And great to have you, Esther, here. So please, if you would just come up live and... Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks very much, Clotilde, for the great uh, talk. Um, uh, one question uh, you already addressed a little bit, I think, uh, uh, in the previous answer, but uh, I was actually wondering, um, where do you think? Uh, or hypothesize uh, where the monocytes and these tumor AVs uh, would meet and whether that would be in the circulation or do you think that those tumors are really infiltrated by the monocytes as they are and then differentiate or what's your idea about this? Yeah, well, actually both possibilities, but I, I think it would, it would probably be phys physically more uh, logical to see the monocytes infiltrating the tumor and then and then be exposed because they could infiltrate the tumor because they see soluble cytokines that or chemokines that attract them that would have gone very far and attract them there and then the the, uh, the EVs would be more concentrated to to meet the monocytes but well, this yeah. is speculation. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, speculation. My, my second question is actually, uh, do you know whether the EVs that you uh, have been studying here also contain DNA? And do you think that that can also contribute to the sting activation? Yeah, yeah. No, indeed, when we saw that, uh, well, of course, we had this very nice C-GAMP sting uh, model, but of course, it turned out not to be as, as simple as that. And uh, indeed, there could be DNA. Uh, we did not try to detect DNA. We know that there is DNA on EVs, generally not inside. Uh, in, in the majority of DNA, when we detect it uh, in other models or in blood or blood EVs, uh, is more on the surface of EVs. Um, but they, there, there can be a tiny proportion that's um, protected from um, DNAs, so inside. Uh, in that case, we did not we did not uh, analyze it, but indeed, yeah, there could be the other types of molecules that could uh, induce the interferon stimulating uh, genes in this model. Mm. Uh, and the last question will um, be asked by Nicole. Hi. Uh, first of all, let me tell you, uh, Dr. Three, that I really admire your work, and I've been following since I was I joined my PhD. So it's very uh, honor really to hear you this and to ask your question. So, um, so um, I was wondering if what when you mentioned that there's differentiation caused by these EVs, is it because you mentioned it because CD one sixty three is decreased in these macrophages? And I asked this question is because like, it has been reported before, like the shedding on CD one sixty three caused macrophage activation. Um, and then my second question was because uh, you show like an M1 profile, like correlation with an M1 profile. And I understand that that's just a nomenclature thing put in 2000. So I understand that. But I'm saying that, did you ever try uh, surface, to check surface markers like CD80 or CD86, which are like M1 profile to see if like those are, uh, those macrophages treated with EVs are reverting to an M1 profile or something like that? Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, 
Uh, again, I'm, I'm not comfortable using the M1 <laughs> profile right, right. term, but, but uh, uh, indeed the first figure of the paper, it shows uh, several other markers than CD163 uh, and CD206. We have in, in fact, I, I, maybe I was a bit confusing when I presented the data, but CD163 is more strongly expressed in the EV rich induced macrophages. Oh. Okay. Then in the EV poor induced macrophages. So CD163 is a bit uh, higher. Uh, in the first figure of the paper, we have other uh, markers. I'm just checking the, the print. Uh, we have a CD. Uh, actually, no, we don't have CD80 and 86. We have other CD88, um, MERTK, PDL1. PDL1 is, is interesting, actually, because it's it's expressed on these macrophages. And even though it's supposed to be a, like a, a inhibiting, I mean, a checkpoint uh, inhibiting immune responses, it's expressed on these macrophages, but it, it does not seem to have uh, uh, consequences on, on immune uh, negative immune effects. So CD80 and 86, uh, I think we didn't try them. Uh, I think they are in the signature, but again, while the paper is now out, I, I, I had put the DOI on the first slide, so I don't know if you could take it. You can download it from there and, and look at uh, all the genes in the signature. Uh, awesome. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. And uh, we, we had another um, question just put like now a minute ago. She, of course, um, congratulated on your talk, and I must say that several other comments did the same. So congratulations from all of them. And um, she's asking, uh, do you isolate or purify specifically breast cancer cell derived EVs from the total tumor sample derived EV pool? And then a comment, although the majority of the EVs are expected to be coming from tumor cells, but was wondering if there could be EVs secreted by other cells in the tumor microenvironment, such as uh, secondary responses. So I'm not sure. So in, in most of the work that I've shown, we isolated EVs from a, a breast cancer cell line cultured in vitro. So there are no other sources of EVs. Um, the only, uh, the only um, results where we isolated EVs from patients, it was from uh, in where we detected CSF1 on the EV, EV, on the secretome of breast tumor explants in vivo. So in that case, no, it was total EVs from the tumor secretome, which could come both from the tumor or from, ma from macrophages or from other cells, fibroblasts, whatever, uh, who, who were there. So uh, in this case, in fact, we don't know if the CSF1 on EVs was coming from tumor EVs or from uh, other cells of the tumor microenvironment, indeed. Yeah, it's true. And just the last question, technical question from my side. Um, so um, I saw that you're using Maxplex with, um, um, and that you're using your own um, uh, secondary antibodies to de for detection, right? Um, so I don't know, we've tried to do that with only a few antibodies. We didn't, we're still trying to explore this further, but um, did you have any problems with that? I mean, is it, do you have any recommendations? What kind of antibodies or how, I don't know, is there, did you Ooh. also experience any problems in? So I, I guess, yeah, we, we can experience, so we, we like to use this Maxplex uh, exo kit in, a, in a, like to get more information than the kit <laughs> suggests to do. So that's why we like to use it with other antibodies. Mm -hmm. We have tried several antibodies um, and for some of them, we do see background that mm -hmm. probably they bind non-specifically to beads. Um, but we always have, we, you know, we all ha always have the negative controls of the beads, not exposed to EVs, but incubated with the secondary antibody. So we always um, do the ratio to this negative control when we analyze our data. Uh, we, we have used several uh, antibodies for other works um, like CD98 or LAMP1 or that kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for some antibodies, yeah, so we had problems that we just did not use them. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, so maybe it's more about the specificity of antibodies. Yeah, yeah, I think you, okay. you, I mean, if you want, okay. we can discuss of 
yeah. kind of antibodies. Probably, in case the ones you tried, we also try them. We can yeah. tell you. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. So yeah. mostly probably for flow cytometry, right? right? Antibodies you use the antibodies that are um, yes, and they are directly coupled. You know, I mean, we we they are directly coupled to APC, which is the 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 labeling that's uh, also coupled to the tetraspanin antibodies that's provided by the mm -hmm. kit. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. perfect. So thank you, Clotilde, again. I think you saw that your work was really well received and there was a lot of questions, discussion, and I think that everybody really enjoyed it. So thank you for taking your time from your busy schedule. And um, I would just like to also thank all the participants and you are all welcome to join us next week for another round of um, exciting science and discussion. So thank you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.